but I took a three-year hiatus to go work up at the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, my early years at Huey, I was uh, running an international marine science program funded by Sea Grant um, and studying international relations and science policy. And then my time up at the Woods Hole Research Center was doing science policy, but it was more terrestrial than it was oceanographic. Um, and it was there that I started going to the COP meetings along with my boss, uh, Kilaparti Ramakrishna, George Woodwell, and then for a while I worked for John Holdren, a name I know you know. So anyway, we're going to launch in to what was accomplished uh, or not at COP21. So before we actually talk about uh, the meeting that happened last December, um, obviously there's a, a 20 plus year history leading up to those particular set of negotiations, but I feel like the immediate year prior was really important. Um, really starting in the September of 2014, uh, Climate Week New York, and this protest, which was uh, the climate march, People's Climate March, uh, an estimated 300,000 people uh, all around the world in coordinated marches on September 21st, 2014, was the largest uh, public gathering and demonstration uh, on the climate issue. And it was, as I said, kind of launching Climate Week New York, where the UN really uh, made an effort to frame the climate change issue and climate change policy in a completely different way. Um, until that point, a lot of the discussion had been a very Kennedy-esque, ask what you can do for your climate, what can you sacrifice for the greater good? Um, and instead, the UN realized, and I think a lot of the environmental community realized, that that's not necessarily going to work, and in fact, that's not necessarily accurate, that putting economics and ecological concerns as uh, opposites uh, really isn't true, and so they released a huge report highlighting uh, ecological and economic win-wins, and really made an attempt to change the, uh, the focus of the discussion to what we can do that will benefit people and economies and the environment all simultaneously. And that kind of kicked off uh, several months of momentum leading up then to uh, COP21 in December of 2015. Uh, we saw in November of 2014 the U.S.-China agreement uh, where both nations made uh, some rather ambitious uh, pledges about their climate uh, plans and emissions policies. China for the first time pledged to cap greenhouse gas emissions and while these were not legally binding, um, this kind of set the tone going into both the COP in 2014 and then in 2015 where instead of being a very top-down process, uh, the entire agreement, as we'll talk about later, is built on voluntary commitments from the 197 parties involved. We also then, in the summer of 2015, completely external to the actual UN process, and certainly external to the scientific process, um, but I think very important for uh, setting the stage and the tone uh, for the talks in, in 2015, was that Pope Francis released an encyclical and de dedicated entirely to environmental issues called Laudato Si. Uh, it was the first time that a papal encyclical had cited scientific documents and in fact cited IPCC reports and was in fact the first time that an encyclical had cited anything other than previous encyclicals and church doctrine. Um, so a real departure uh, for the Vatican and uh, really highlighting the connections between human rights and environmental issues, which was a theme that, that played out in the COP. So even just going into uh, COP21 in Paris, I think there was a really different feeling. There was a different level of momentum. Uh, Judy actually kind of invited me to come. I hadn't been planning to go. And uh, I've, I've said before, if it had been the year before that she'd said, I really think you should go and report on a COP, I would have said, yeah, maybe not. There's not a lot that's been actually happening at the COPs. But the energy going into COP21 in Paris was, um, was very different. Um, and Judy's going to tell you from her deep history and understanding of it how it actually works behind the scenes. Okay, so this is where you run into a lot of acronyms. Um, so the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change um, was uh, one of the three Rio conventions that came out of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Um, that probably Al Gore's defining moment was going to the Earth Summit. Um, and that convention bound member states to act in the interest of safety, even in the face of scientific uncertainty. And I think that we can now take the uncertainty out of it. 
Um, the COP is a conference of the parties to the convention, um, and this is a UN body um, that is a conference to the party. Um, the first COP was in 1995. Uh, the Paris uh, meeting was COP 21, um, and COP 22 will be taking place November of this year in Morocco. So the COP has a responsibility um, to all of its member states that have signed on to a treaty to meet um, annually. Um, they have subsidiary bodies um, under the umbrella. And I've listed the two permanent subsidiary bodies. And the one I think that is probably of most interest to this group is the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice. Um, and as I said down here, they support the work of the COP um, to make sure that I mean, timely information and advice um, and timely in the UN is on a very different clock than it is for a few scientists. Um, so that like a super tanker moves a little slowly, doesn't take any sharp turns. Um, the subsidiary body for implementation takes the information and figures out how to implement the convention or the Kyoto Protocol. And now we'll be adding the Paris Agreement to this. So an organization that I know some of you have been very involved with is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the IPCC um, has, it, it's collaborative with the COP. The COP will often ask the IPCC for its assistance. Um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, there used to be an organization in Washington, the Office of Technology Assessment, that served at the pleasure of Congress. Um, and IPCC is pretty much like that, although they're revved up on their own work. Um, at its 43rd session in April, um, they decided to include the following products, um, that, that new NSF uh, I, <laughs> moniker we get to use instead of publications. Um, and one is a special report on the impacts of global warming on the 1.5 degree above pre-industrial levels, and Heather's going to talk about how that came out and came through the Paris Agreement. And the second is the special report on climate change and the oceans in the cryosphere. And we're also going to talk about how oceans have very slowly found their way into any mention of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So meanwhile, back in Paris. Um, you know, we, we didn't suffer when we were in Paris. And I want you to keep in mind, though, that it was three weeks after the November 13th bombings and um, the destruction that went on in Paris. But the community in Paris was very almost joyous about the fact that the climate conference was coming to town and that it was approaching Christmas. This was an installation that we read about the night before we went up to see it at the Pantheon. Um, it was by uh, a Dutch, Swedish artist. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Who uh, managed to get these calved burgie bits um, and brought them and installed them uh, with 12 stations, like a clock. Um, uh, it was a couple of days before the climate conference was to begin. Um, and then, um, uh, let's see. Uh, good for me, please, madam. <laughs> um, um, and then uh, you can see what happened uh, a week later, week two. Um, they, the sizes had greatly reduced, and it was, it was a case in point about the melting of the Arctic and Antarctic ice caps. So um, now uh, you want to swing into what, was, uh, what else was going on in Paris related to climate? Yes, yeah, so this is actually from uh, the last day, well, should have been the day after, but uh, the, the talks went into the, the final Saturday. Um, because of the terrorist attacks on November 13th, uh, Parisian officials had said no demonstrations. There was actually supposed to be a repeat of the People's Climate March uh, to launch the talks. And they said, we can't have that large a gathering. Uh, it's too much of a security risk. And uh, groups from around the world said, OK, we respect that. We won't do the, the People's Climate March to open the talks. And by the end of the talks, there was a sense that um, they were ready to actually uh, disregard the restrictions that Parisian officials were attempting to enforce that the world needed to hear uh, the voice of public advocates and ensure that this uh, climate agreement that, um, you know, depending on who you talk to, and there were plenty of people to talk to, uh, it seemed like it was really going through, but there was a lot of concern that it was not going to be strong enough. And so uh, on the final Saturday, uh, a large number of protesters took to the streets of Paris uh, to draw a red line uh, to for the world to see that went right up Champs-Élysées. Um, and this is a little bit of that, that protest. Um, that, of course, also had uh, 
protests associated with it around the world um, as well. But you can see there the, um, the Eiffel Tower with their 100% renewable uh, form that they did there. Um, that, that theme, that's kind of a little bit of the, the, what it seemed like in Paris more broadly. We spent most of our time back at, at Bourget where the actual conference was taking place. And I'll let Judy, she's got some fabulous shots of what it was like to be there with the tens of thousands of people. So um, Le Bourget, uh, for the older folks in the audience, might ring a bell. It was the airport at which, uh, the landing strip at which Lindbergh landed after his first cross of him flight. Um, there are still some hangars out there, and I think it is still a working airport, but very small. Um, and those hangars were converted um, to become the scene of the climate conference. So when I first started going to the um, annual COP meetings, um, I went to Montreal in 2005, and there were five or 6,000 people there. Um, by the time I went to Copenhagen in 2009, uh, there were about 30,000 people expected, and a few more showed up. Um, and so, next slide. Uh, gives you the numbers that we were dealing with. And these are the people who, in effect, were registered. Um, so 198 countries or entities, which includes the EU, um, and then the number of countries or <coughs> members and the number of delegates from those countries, the UN secretariat bodies, um, the intergovernmental organizations, the non-governmental organizations, which um, HUI is a non-governmental organization. We're registered observers since 2010. Um, and get all sorts of perks for being a registered observer. <laughs> um, so um, there were approximately 36,000 people that the UN could account for. But um, Paris, the host country of France, was very smart in the way they set up the logistics and the planning and the structure for this meeting. So they had a blue zone, which you had to have a special UN badge to get access to, and that's where the delegates did all their negotiations and a lot of the side events, which was not a circus. They're more like upper level graduate seminars being offered by a lot of the groups that are coming to it. But in the plenary sessions is where the work was done, with the delegates in large meetings breaking out into smaller meetings. Um, and so this is the inside of one of those hangars converted to accommodate um, about 30, about to 20,000 people who were in the delegate group. Um, so the opening day, um, all of traffic in Paris was stalled. Uh, there was no public transportation because 160 leaders of countries had come to town for in one day, one, one and a half days, they each gave a five minute speech. And here's Obama doing his five minutes, um, Angela Merkel and Putin in the green room uh, while they're waiting to go on. Um, then there was a, another aspect to this, which was the public that was coming to see what was going on at the climate conference. So aside from the 36,000 36, legal people, there was the public and folks had come from around the world, um, Guatemalan coffee growers who didn't have badges to get in, um, and they set up this green zone um, further away from the main show, um, which was uh, public exhibits and also some of the side event talks. This is the entrance in. Now, this wasn't at any of the old hangars. This was a structure that was totally built, pretty much plywood. Everything was recyclable that was inside as well as the structure itself. Um, just an instance of some of the talks that were there. Lauren Molyneux of Huey um, presented um, when she was talking about uh, climate change and the impact on oceans and coasts. Um, and you know, in the audience, we had the executive secretary of IOC and the secretary general of the WMO. So um, it, it's not. It's not just for fun. <laughs> and I'm going to let Heather talk about this next shot. Although, of course, there is some fun to be had. Um, so within the, within the blue zone, uh, where I spent most of my time, there was kind of a, a central boulevard. And at one point, I was walking up the boulevard very quickly, trying to get to some interview. And I saw a large group of people come flowing out of one door. And there were women squealing, like excited. I thought the Beatles had arrived. And I went to see what was going on. And in fact, it was Arnie. Um, I was a little surprised by that response, but you certainly did see plenty of, of celebrities around as well. Um, on that same boulevard it was also the place where, um, and, and Judy reminded me this morning, it's important to note we can't necessarily call these people protesters. They all had to go through the same UN uh, verification and had to be approved. And in fact, 
to the point that with these uh, women of the Global South who were protesting on that main boulevard, they told me they had to have their signs approved and that these were the toned down version of signs that apparently had been deemed too provocative um, by the UN. So all of the, the protests or demonstrations that could be seen uh, within that um, actual uh, diplomatic area had, had all been uh, approved, but there certainly were a constant stream of these demonstrations. As I said, this was women of the global south uh, trying to promote gender equality. Um, the UN recognizes that globally women are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, we also... Could we go back one shot? I just yeah. want to mention something. Arnold Schwarzenegger brings to mind something about the United States, which is unusual in the, the climate change world. That is that we do not have a national climate plan. Um, there's, there have been attempts. John Kerry, I think, was the last one to try and get something through the Senate. But our Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was governor of California, and along with his environment secretary, signed an agreement with the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil, that both that state and our state of California would seek to reduce their emissions way before, this was back in 2005, when Arnold Schwarzenegger came to the COP meeting in Montreal. So in the United States, we're still doing it state by state. Um, there's a really great book called State House versus Greenhouse. Um, and I'm not even sure where we are in Massachusetts. It changes with the administration. Anyway, I just wanted you to know, he does know about climate change. Oh, he definitely change. does know about climate change. No, um, and, and I would say that also highlights another big theme from this meeting, which is that we, we finally do have an international agreement, but um, as we'll come back to you later, that does not preclude local action. In fact, um, mayors from around the world were one of the most vocal groups um, at this, this Paris meeting. Um, in addition to women, uh, we saw a lot of youth protesters. Uh, this was a group uh, saying, don't bracket our future. They've got tape over their mouths, and it's kind of a play on the uh, how actually negotiating these treaties works because when you actually look at the document, square brackets indicates text that is still under negotiation. And so one really rough way uh, that in the newsroom, and newsroom of course is a loose term when you have 3,700 people, it was an enormous multi-story building. Um, one way you could generally track how much progress was being made was to see how long the document was and how many square brackets were left. And on the final Wednesday, uh, we were at 40 odd, or I guess, you know, by Wednesday it had dropped to, to 27 pages um, and 60 this odd. Is the agreement. Yeah, the agreement was, was 27 pages long and 60 odd uh, sets of square brackets. And that's when there started to, to be a ramp up in concern can this actually get done? Can we resolve 67 different things in two days of negotiations? And you see, it happened really quite quickly. Um, there was a lot that got done in those final couple of days. Um, and what we ended up with, um, and this is pretty blatantly plagiarized, although a few things added um, from Phil Duffy, the, the uh, director of the Woods Hole Research Center, a slide that, that he had to um, summarize things. So 195 countries agreed to the Paris Agreement. 188 countries um, committed to emissions reductions through 2030. These are all through voluntary plans that they submitted, not the UN telling uh, the nations what they need to do, but the nations telling the UN what they are willing and able to do. And in fact, for developing nations, they were asked to submit two different plans, what they are able to do on their own and what they would like to do with help and how much help they need to do it. Um, what the agreement stipulates is a five-year plan for countries, a five-year period for uh, countries to come back and uh, update their goals. Each, every five years, they have to come back and actually set more ambitious goals than what they had five years before. So this is uh, ramping up uh, the ambition of the agreement. Uh, they actually have to report back every two years on progress toward those goals. So there's a constant monitoring and reporting um, that is a legally binding aspect of this agreement. So that means that in 2020, if you're interested in going to the COP meeting, we can promise it will be exciting. That. So 2020 will be the next time that the countries have to up the ante and um, submit new climate goals. Um, but the overall target that was uh, specified in this goal, in, in this agreement, was really pretty groundbreaking. And I have to say the first draft uh, where this goal statement appeared, there was an audible gasp that went through that 3,000 person news building. 
Um, one of the other groups that I didn't have a photo of to show that was very vocal um, on the boulevard and in the negotiating rooms was small island developing states. And uh, they coined a phrase 1.5 to survive. So for the past 10 or so years, kind of the, uh, the goal of most UN negotiations has been to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. Um, that is what the science had said would avoid the worst and most dangerous impacts of climate change. And as the science has progressed, uh, there's been a lot of concern that that's in fact too dangerous. And these states were saying we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees if um, th these nations in a lot of cases are uh, facing the prospect of becoming an entirely new state, uh, a kind of state in international law where they would be actually called uh, nations ex situ, where they have no ter habitable territory of their own because they've been submerged um, by sea level rise and the ground, even before that, the ground and the drinking water um, will have been destroyed by saltwater intrusion. And some of these nations like Kiribati are looking at that happening within um, somewhere between three and eight decades. So the middle to the end of this century, they have a very existential threat that they're facing and I don't think anybody really thought that their 1.5 to survive um, and that their voice in the negotiations would be enough to change that overall goal. Um, but in fact, what ended up being agreed to was um, that kind of a middle of the road, two de at no more than two degrees and ideally closer to a 1.5 degree target. Um, and we'll come back to this later, but this agreement is uh, the first time ever that the word ocean actually appeared in a, uh, a COP agreement or draft agreement, and it appears exactly once. And we might mention that it was at one point bracketed. Oh, it was, it was bracketed and it was in and out and it was moved around. Um, oceans kind of bounced in and out. There was an Oceans Day that I was not there for. It happened the Friday before I arrived, um, where apparently Oceans was in at the beginning of the day, and then partway through the morning, they got word that Oceans had been removed, and there was a call put out to everybody, talk to your delegates, talk to anybody you know, make sure oceans get back in, and it went back in by the end of Friday, and then it was maybe out again over the weekend, and then it was back in, and then over the course of the last week, it, it moved around how it was mentioned, but. Um, and I like to make the case about the fact that the word marine, however, has appeared for several treaties and agreements, um, but only as the descriptor for the words bunker fuel. So uh, you can see they get very specific about some things, but somehow the oceans uh, as a concept were left out, but we're in, in the preamble. Yes, in the preamble, in the statement of values, essentially. Um, so for this agreement to go into force, um, there's something called the 55-55 the rule, which is that when 55 parties accounting for 55% of global emissions have ratified the agreement, it will go into force. It was initially thought that that would probably be around 2020. Um, at this point, there's uh, the, the signing part, which comes before the ratification part for, for most nations, um, has been going more quickly than expected. And there's been some thought that this agreement could go into force as soon as 2018, but for that to happen, really what we have to have is the US, China, and then at least one other top emitter. Um, the US and China, I think, together account for about 38% of emissions, and then you need um, some other big emitters to get up to that 55%. Right now, we have 20 parties who've ratified, but they only account for 0.4% of emissions. So, um, The US, uh, our commitments that we've made voluntarily are to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28% below uh, 2005 levels. And this is basically uh, what the Obama administration uh, said they could accomplish through the clean power plan and uh, fuel, emit, fuel uh, efficiency standards and other executive actions um, with no help from Congress. The US has also pledged $3 billion to the Green Climate Fund, which is an international fund to aid developing nations with their climate um, mitigation and adaptation plans. And then while we were at the COP, uh, Secretary of State Kerry also pledged, uh, created, announced the creation of another $800 million fund specifically for adaptation um, efforts for states like those small island developing states that are, that are already facing severe and unavoidable impacts. Can I just mention, um, there's been a groundswell maybe over the last five years to try and establish a blue carbon fund um, comparable to the Green Climate Fund, um, green versus blue, um, but it hasn't gotten any traction, um, and I don't know about funding. Um, if it doesn't have enough traction to have countries signing on, um, but stay tuned because now that we're in the treaty, um, perhaps the Blue Carbon Fund will grow. So there's been a lot of questioning since this agreement uh, was formed. Is it enough? Um, I spoke with John Holdren shortly before the meeting, and he said, of course, it's not enough. 
It was never intended to be enough. It's a critical first step. And one thing I definitely heard is that it's critical um, for the business community to have this signal from the international um, policy arena that this is the direction that the world is moving, giving them the security to move forward with their own climate action. So um, one thing that I heard over and over is that this agreement isn't necessarily just about forcing governments to create federal climate plans. It's about creating the umbrella environment for businesses, for states, for cities, for individuals to take the actions that they might like to take but need that security of knowing that this is where the, the entire international community is going to move. The question is, of course, can we do it? Um, and the answer that I got from, there was a, a panel the morning after that, the first time at 1.5 uh, Target appeared in a document, um, a draft document. There was a panel that uh, was in a room probably the size of only this central uh, set of seats, a small side room, and uh, the opening joke was, they say nobody wants to hear from scientists at a COP. Uh, it was a panel of scientists who model how we actually get to um, a two degree target. Uh, it was packed, it was overflowing, they were removing media because of fire safety concerns. Um, and the question was, can we do it? And the answer was, quite frankly, we don't know. We've never even tried to model a 1.5 degree scenario. We've never modeled anything more ambitious than two degrees, but we'll start working on that this weekend. And as you saw, that's one of the things that the IPCC is hopefully gonna be working on is the scenarios for how we would uh, stay within that 1.5 degree uh, target. But the other thing that we heard is back of the envelope, what we will probably end up doing is overshooting and needing to come back and needing some sort of uh, carbon capture use and storage technology that that's probably going to be critical if we're going to um, eventually hit that 1.5 degree uh, target. And that same modeler told me, I said, okay, so what does that look like? What does that carbon capture uh, and storage look like? And he said, honestly, at the moment, the best technology we have is massive afforestation and reforestation. Trees are the best technology we currently have for sucking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. However, we're certainly, uh, people are moving forward with other ideas. Um, the picture in the top right there is the Boundary Dam Carbon Capture Storage Power Plant in Saskatchewan, the first carbon capture storage power plant in the world. It's been pretty controversial. It's been on and offline for a little over a year which critics say is proof that carbon capture storage on a power plant can never work, and supporters say is absolutely expected for a completely unprecedented technology that it's gonna have some, some fits and starts. Um, one thing that was at the, the COP, I did not unfortunately get to see it myself because each of the, the nations gets to have their own pavilion, and Saudi Arabia's pavilion was a maze of rooms, and I apparently didn't get far enough into the Saudi pavilion to see their um, Saudi Aramco's carbon capture storage car. This is a prototype car. Apparently, um, based on an article I was reading on this, the carbon capture storage cartridge technology, it's basically a, a filtration and cartridge system that would um, be as part of the exhaust system, currently takes up about half the trunk of that car. They're working on shrinking that, but the, the theory is that you would pull into a gas station and while you're putting gas in one place, you'd be pulling out a used cartridge and dumping that somewhere, the question is, where do all those cartridges go and what do you do with them um, <laughs> to actually sequester that carbon? Um, and then one thing that, that Judy and I have talked a lot about is also the idea, and a lot of people are starting to talk about the idea that it's not enough to just sequester carbon. We need to be a lot smarter about how we use carbon. Um, XPRIZE has announced shortly before uh, the COP in 2015 a new prize for making a valuable product out of uh, power plant emissions. Um, so that's, they're kind of trying to find those kinds of technologies. One that's actually um, up and running, at least on a small scale, economically, is a company called New Light that makes these chairs that they call air carbon chairs out of methane emissions from farms. And they um, have a number of commercial deals, but they actually just signed a deal with IKEA. Um, so IKEA may soon be selling chairs made out of, out of methane emissions. And what's your nickname for it? <laughs> Okay, so I have three young boys, and so I, I thought, you know, there's nothing as irresistible to three young boys as the idea of a, as a, of a chair made out of cow farts. I don't know how well that will work as a general uh, promotion technique, but um, yeah, it got my kids pretty excited. <laughs> and if I could just mention, uh, there is a project uh, in Norway, actually offshore, in the North Sea, that's been going for 20 years, which is the sleep mirror carbon capture storage, so for the production of natural gas, they're putting the CO2 right back into the ground. 
Um, but what we keep talking about, and I think we're novices, is when we can find the use for carbon and make it a value as opposed to a problem that we need to find solutions for, then we can really make progress. Uh, that's really the whole point of the, the X Prize um, for making something valuable out of power plant emissions is the idea that um, economists have pretty much hands down said the most effective way to deal with climate change would be to put a price on carbon and that a lot of this other stuff would take care of itself, a lot of the policy would take care of itself. That of course has been very controversial, nobody likes to impose a new tax and so XPRIZE said why don't we flip this on its head and put a value on carbon by creating a market for carbon. If there's something that we can make out of these emissions then suddenly they're valuable, people will want them and people will pay for them. So they're trying to do that in an organic uh, ground up way. So where does the ocean fit in all this? This is actually the, a couple of paragraphs from the preamble of uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, the top one, actually, oceans had been in at some point. So recognizing the importance of the conservation and enhancement, as appropriate, of sinks and reservoirs of the greenhouse gases referred to in the convention. So as I said, both forests and oceans had at some point been mentioned in there as natural sinks that might, as appropriate, um, whoever deems what's appropriate, um, be enhanced in some way. Where oceans ended up was in this, this uh, little bit more touchy-feely, noting the importance of ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans, and the protection of biodiversity, recognized by some cultures as Mother Earth, and noting the importance for some of the concept of climate justice when taking action to address climate change. So there's a whole bunch of things smooshed into that one, but I did find it interesting that out of all the ecosystems that could have been mentioned, oceans were the only one that actually managed to remain in there by the end of the agreement. Um, and so I think uh, for you, uh, I, I would invite you to think about how oceans uh, could be part of this, um, whether there are appropriate ways to enhance the ability of the ocean as a sink, whether we even know enough about the ocean as a sink, um, and also uh, to consider, and I know I'm, I'm uh, being an advocate here, but consider your role and whether you might have a role in some of these um, policy decisions. Certainly there was a group from the Woods Hole Research Center who was at COP21. They organized their own side event specifically about cryosphere issues. Um, it was very well attended by very high level diplomats. And the entire point there was that in the carbon budgets that are currently in IPCC models, the cryosphere is very poorly represented because the uncertainty has been so high. Um, and yet what we do know all indicates that as uh, melting of permafrost really gets going, um, it may actually eat up half of the carbon budget that's currently the basis for all of these negotiations. And that hasn't been really put in front of the negotiators. Um, because it's not part of those IPCC reports. And so they took it upon themselves to show up and put it directly in front of negotiators. And as a result, um, there will be a special report on oceans and cryospheres. And so I think there is a potential role for scientists that is underutilized for, for really making sure that the science is right in front of the diplomats. And I'll end with, uh, let's see if I can get this to, to pull up. A little clip from President Obama's last State of the Union address. 60 years ago, when the Russians beat us into space, we didn't deny Sputnik was up there. <laughs> we didn't argue about the science or shrink our research and development budget. We built a space program almost overnight, and 12 years later, we were walking on the moon. So I, I like to end with that, and I know it gets a chuckle, especially in this audience. It was widely seen as a hysterical jab at climate deniers. Um, I took it as something else as well, um, which is that the climate problem can seem very overwhelming, and it can be hard for anyone, scientists or otherwise, to figure out uh, where we all fit in the solution. But I think part of the point that President Obama made very powerfully there is that we've addressed uh, challenges that have seemed impossible before and in some cases done it very rapidly and that if we put our mind to it I think there's still a lot that that could be done um, on the climate issue and, and I would just like to um, let you know about we've talked about global versus local there's going to be a talk next week I think maybe in this room if not up at Clark August 2nd Naomi Orestes who is one of the co-authors of Merchants of Doubt um, is going to be talking as the Steinbach scholar institution-wide and I believe the title of her talk is something like The Scientist as Sentinel, Science, Policy, and Politics. 
So you got to get your hands dirty. Um, and uh, I think she's a, a good guide on how to do that. Um, if you'd like to get your hands dirty by going to a COP meeting, um, uh, the first, the last three weeks of November, um, the COP will be taking place in Morocco. Um, the deadline to nominate people to go, which is part of my job, is August 2nd. Um, I ask for twice as many spots as we think we might need. So um, if you give me um, your email and you're interested in going, um, I can nominate you uh, from Hui or from any other institution. You'd be going under the moniker of Hui. So um, wrapping that up, thank you for being a very good audience. Twenty minutes for discussion and questions. Ken Johnson, Mabari. So, what was the background for the lack of interest in the ocean? <laughs> uh, this was my first cop. So, Judy, do you want to tackle that one? Um, I don't want to say underrepresented, since there are so many coastal countries in the world. But um, I think the, the measurement issue of um, you know, doing carbon dioxide measurements uh, in the ocean has been a toughie. I, I work for a fellow named Rich Camilli, um, who builds very small mass spectrometers that work down to 5,000 meters in situ. Um, he's now fitting it to go into a glider. But to get that kind of sense of just how much of a carbon sink the ocean is, we've, we've, got, we've got the measurements on the terrestrial side. The Woods Hole Research Center has been one of the leaders in that. But um, I, it's a really good question, and I, I don't know why the avoidance has been there on the oceans. I, mean, I don't know entirely, well, I don't know if it's avoidance or not. I, I have talked to a couple of um, you know, IPCC uh, coordinating authors, and they basically just say it started from atmospheric scientists, and um, there's just been some inertia. It just hasn't changed. Um, so whether that's a lack of um, pushing from the ocean science community or a lack of asking from the IPCC or, or you know, where that barrier has been, I don't know. But some of it is just the history that this started as an atmospheric issue with an underappreciation of how involved the ocean was. Um, it was about putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and so that's where it started and that's kind of where it has stayed. Um, yeah, I have a, this is Jim Moffat from USC. I have a question for Heather about the, um, the media coverage of the, um, uh, of the conference, and it's related to the sort of larger issue that, as you know, the, the, the big organizations that, that support the, the, the sort of the climate denial perspective are run by the, the news corporations. So Fox News, uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, so forth. There are big changes going on in that organization. Uh, they recently acquired the National Geographic Group, which ha has, in the last few years, done a lot of great issues related to this problem. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering, from your perspective as a journalist, is there a glimmer of hope there? I mean, Roger Ailes is out. The two sons are, the Murdoch sons are taking over. Um, do you see any, any I, I mean, for example, if you, go to, if you went to Fox News during this, during this conference, you got a very different perspective than you got from other media outlets. Same with the Wall Street Journal. I mean, it was basically, you know, a, a convention of idiots was how they sort of... And, and so, you know, I don't know, with Fox News, I don't know if the, the rest of us have just kind of written them off. Um, the Wall Street Journal has certainly been called out um, for, for some of their their coverage, some of the op-eds that they've chosen to run and, and the authors that they choose to, um, to, to solicit content from. But I would say that um, I think those are the exception. I, I really do, and I don't think that's just my perspective. I've, I've looked at um, some of the research, and actually going back, there was a, a seminal study in 2004 uh, that coined this, frame, this phrase, balance as bias and looked at, um, it was Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, maybe Washington Post, kind of the four top you know, newspapers in the country and said, okay, well, over half of these um, articles are presenting 
climate change as a he said, she said issue, which may be a traditional way of doing things in journalism, but it doesn't work with a science issue like this, and the attempt at balance is creating actually a bias against climate science. Five years later, 2009, same social scientist went back and looked at it again, and words from his paper, we may be flogging a dead norm. That in fact, by 2009, um, it was something somewhere in the 90s, 90 plus percent of that top tier elite coverage of climate change was presenting climate change as primarily caused by humans and um, not a scientific debate. So I, I think we've got still a little bit of a, a cultural hangover though from that phase where it, the science was being presented as more of a debate than it was. But I think at this point the media is on the whole um, presenting climate change pretty well in terms of representing um, the science and, and, and I think that the New York Times does it, Justin Gillis tends to do it in, in a way that I, I think handles it pretty well because you can't ignore the fact that there is a large part of our political system that denies this issue. You can't just ignore that because that wouldn't be realistic anyway, either. And so what Justin Gillis tends to do in his coverage for the New York Times is present the science issue, the social issues that go along with it, here are the problems or here are the innovations, and then kind of, you know, that'll be on the front page and if you continue reading, somewhere later in the article he'll mention that there is a political debate and make it very clear that he's saying this is a political debate about this, and so making that distinction. Um, but I think we've made a lot of progress, I, I really do, and I think one of the struggles in the media at this point is really when you have an issue that is this clear scientifically, that presents such an enormous threat, how do you cover that and not actually seem like an advocate and stop short of telling people what to do um, and not become essentially a climate activist in your work? I think that's kind of where the, the debate for most people in the media is at this point. Uh, Jim Bishop, University of California, Berkeley. Um, reading the two paragraphs, so the, the upper one was, was in the document or just the yeah. noting? Yeah, no, those, those were both paragraphs from the, the preamble, which is about a, I don't even know how long, a very long statement of these paragraphs of kind of value statements. Right, so, so the statement says, re recognizing the importance of conservation and enhancement as appropriate of sinks and reservoirs of green and house gases. How does that, how, it, I just wonder about the specter of people massively going to sea and dumping iron in the ocean or piping CO2 down pipes into the deep sea. This is sort of technologies that have been investigated a couple of decades ago. And I'm not against trying, but the question is, is that what people were thinking of? When, when I certainly think that's a nod to the geoengineering idea, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I think that's one of the places of the most open debate within climate science and climate policy is, is what, what is reasonable, how much research should we even be doing on geoengineering if that opens the door for something that might be unsafe. And on the other side, people saying, look, if we're really gonna try to stick to 1.5C, when we've potentially overshot that already by 2020 or 2025 and we've gotta do something to rein it back, then maybe we should be considering. Um, and so I think that phrase, as appropriate, like I said, that leaves a lot open to interpretation, but certainly that's a nod to, to the idea of geoengineering and, and these large scale uh, kinds of projects. Right, so my, my, my feeling is so far, none of the 13 iron fertilization experiments had predictable results in terms of being able to predict the communities that grew up in response to the fertilization. And we're, you know, day before yesterday, we were talking about programs that would be proposed to NASA or NSF to actually look at the biological carbon pump in detail. The, the question is, if, if we don't have a chance to understand a natural system, and then we're talking about manipulating it without understanding how it will operate, I think we're flying without a flight plan so to me, the basic research needs to get a leg up before people start jumping on the iron fertilization equivalent bandwagon. Well, obviously you guys are the, the scientists in this area, but, but one story I've been following on a local level that I think again highlights this local global um, issue 
is um, kelp farmers in the Gulf of Maine who are finding that on a very local level, growing kelp near shellfish beds reduces um, the carbon dioxide levels in the water locally, so reduces acidification, enhances shellfish growth, and they're starting to sell the kelp um, and the seaweed as a, as a food. So, you know, is that the route we want to go? But, that, but maybe looking at this as, as also the potential for local enhancement, just, not just looking at the ocean as one big ocean where we're looking at global enhancement. So, r real quick, one, one way for this community, there, there have been a number of National Academy studies, the most recent was last year, that looked at a, a whole report on these different CO2 technologies, including iron fertilization, afforestation, more uh, industrial. So for folks who are interested, that might be a good spot to sort of get up to, on the literature and some of the discussions. And it was not just what is the science, but also how would you move forward? How would research contribute? So I think that's a, a, a valuable um, something for this community to take a look at. I think we had one over here. Yeah. Yes, and those reports are on the OCB website. Hi, um, Rob Condon, UNC Wilmington. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I, I think the question I was going to ask is kind of related to what, what Jim Bishop was talking about. Um, I watched some of the, actual, the sessions and talks from COP21 and um, was actually a little frustrated, not a little, I was frustrated a lot and, and disappointed at the lack of ocean representation. And even that sort of adjunct ocean session really was just, it was disjointed and um, and I think the message that sort of comes out from that is that how can we be taken seriously as a community if we can't really get our act into gear? And that's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because we're trying to get involved and, and get more ocean research involved. So as we've been discussing in this workshop with NASA exports potentially coming online and, and things like that, and this 1.5 degree Celsius sort of target um, have we as, as a community even sort of sat down and thought about how efficient does the biological pump have to be to actually meet those goals, if it was just up to the oceans? Have we as a community come up with those type of analyses to actually say, right, this is what needs to happen, and maybe that's a way to move forward because it's only a problem if we can't provide a solution, right? We can complain all the time, but maybe that's a way to say, right, here's a potential solution, here are scenarios that we can present to the wider community moving forward. Okay, uh, Zach Erickson, Caltech. Uh, I'm wondering, yeah, so I'm wondering, you mentioned that a lot of economists say that you want a price on carbon and that's the most efficient way to do it, but you kind of said that there's this idea that maybe we should make carbon emissions valuable instead. And I guess I've never thought about this, so it's confusing to me because it seems like what you want to do from a carbon cycle perspective is either stop fluxes out of various carbon sinks or increase fluxes into other carbon sinks. And you're not doing the first one if you're making emissions valuable because of supply and demand. If anything, you're increasing that flux out of them and it doesn't seem like you're creating a new carbon sink unless various products that you make become a carbon sink. Um, so anyway, I guess I'm just confused at the idea of making these emissions valuable. Is it fair to say we're confused as well? <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so here's my, you know, I, 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 I take your point that if we're putting a value on them, would we, wouldn't we want to make more emissions? Um, but I think the idea with putting a value on them is that if they are valuable, you're not going to just let those emissions go into the atmosphere and become a greenhouse gas problem. You're going to capture them and do something with them. And um, certainly it's not like this is a, you know, tie a bow on it and we've got the, the solution to climate change, um, because there is the big question of then how do you turn that into long-term sequestration? But another scenario that, um, that was thrown out at me when I asked some similar questions was, okay, so, you know, so let's start with the idea maybe of massive afforestation. So you plant a whole bunch of trees and you put a biomass burning power plant next to it and you selectively log and you burn the trees for electricity. You also capture the excess heat and use that to heat homes or businesses. 
you use the electricity, you capture the emissions, you make something else out of the emissions, you use that. Um, maybe it's actually something where you take those power plant emissions, you bubble them through algal um, growth chambers and make algal biofuel. You use that fuel, you capture your emissions, you do something else with it. So that for that one kind of set of carbon emissions, that unit of carbon emissions, you've actually accomplished five, six, seven, eight things. You've recycled it over and over and over. And then the challenge at the end is to make sure that what's left over gets sequestered long term. But what we're doing right now is treating carbon as a single use disposable. And I think part of the idea in finding ways to use um, emissions and kind of leftover carbon is to eliminate that, that single use disposable way of using carbon and create this, this way of reusing and then eventually sequestering. Not that it's all tied up and done, but, but that's kind of the thinking that was explained to me. So I think the term for what you're describing is cogeneration, where you, you keep you, almost a closed loop, except for that leakage, a small amount, of, you hope for a small amount of leakage. My name is Joachim Gaisa from Columbia University. Um, I, one of the problems that I've had as a scientist is trying to communicate with um, uh, journalists. And um, I've been at a campus meeting. I've met some of the journalists who are interested in uh, climate uh, science. But really, it has been difficult to follow up with them because they are busy with so many other things. Um, but I think that the tide is slowly changing. and. Um, just in this past one month, I've got five calls from different journalists. Uh, sometime back, I, I uh, presented some work in Oman. Um, and as you know, the tropics are changing uh, disproportionately to uh, what is happening in temperate waters. So we studied these huge uh, and unusual blooms um, off the coast of Oman. And over the 10 years that we have been doing this now, uh, through the help of NASA and NSF, uh, we have found that the blooms have become so big that they are destroying every aspect of their lifestyle. Uh, it's affecting tourism. It's affecting their desalination plants. As you know, Oman is not a, an oil-producing country, so it has a lot of refineries which de depend on intake of seawater for cooling those refineries. So whenever there is this massive bloom, it uh, shuts down their system. But they are also a, a big aquaculture industry along the coast, and that is also slowly collapsing. Their fisheries has changed from a fish-dominated system to a squid-dominated system. Uh, but the problem is that Oman is, has got a social justice system which takes care of their people. This is happening in Yemen now. It is happening in Somalia. And you can see the difference in how it is affecting people's lives. You see in uh, Yemen and in Somalia, they're becoming more uh, violent and rabid. And the piracy originated in Oman, uh, uh, in Somalia. And so we need some help to communicate these stories. And they are real. Um, uh, it's uh, causing a lot of uh, political insecurity in those areas, which is affecting us ultimately here in the US and many countries around the world. So. Um, we need help to tell the stories, and I'm not sure how you can help us. But um, in the run-up to COP22, we have been contacted by some journalists from, who's based in Jordan. He's with AP. And he said that there's been a big shift in their bureau uh, where they've created a special climate uh, cell. And uh, they're communicating with NASA now to get these stories out before COP22. And in fact, he's making a video in the run-up to COP22, which is focused on issues in the Middle East. And so this will be part of the story. Excellent. Well, my, my one short answer is I have cards down here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and the other thing I would, I would say to everybody, and I try always to say to groups of scientists, is um, you know, you're already reaching out to journalists. Try to form relationships with journalists that you trust. Um, not just calling them when you necessarily have the nature paper, um, but if you've got somebody local or somebody that you see at a conference on a regular basis, have coffee once a year, tell them where your science stands so that maybe when there's some other news that breaks, your science might have some relevance or a side angle that they can use as well, that it's not just when you have your big paper that's published necessarily that your science should be in the news. Um, so try to keep those relationships up. So we're 
coming to the end, we're going to do two more questions and then finish it off. Hi, I'm Bethany Edwards from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, I was a joint program student here in, in Woods Hole and um, took a global um, policy and science course and went to the UN um, convention uh, where the Minamata Convention was written and spent, some, spent a lot of time thinking about public policy and um, international treaties. And one of the things that kind of shocked me was that since the Montreal Protocol, which was written in the 80s, um, to uh, prevent ozone depletion, um, there really hasn't been a effective international treaty on environmental issues. Um, and so I'm wondering if perhaps the better route or more effective route would be to get on the U.S. We need a national climate plan. Um, and if you know of any organizations that are working towards that, things that we as scientists can get involved in and push on. Um, that, I think that would be really useful information. Well, there is a, a national, it's actually an international organization, but it's the Climate Action Network, um, and it's U.S., um, and it is activists, which is not a dirty word, um, and some politicians. Um, the Woods Hole Research Center is a very active member of the CAN Climate Action Network. Um, that, it, it's sort of like a, uh, an incubator for science coming in and policy going out um, and, and the communication. So that, that's one organization I can think that might be useful for you. And they are very active at the COP meetings. Um, Substa and STI meet uh, in May, April or May of each year as a run up to the COP meeting. Um, plus the full time jobs for a lot of people on these permanent bodies. So the connections can be made. Um, to reach out and pull, pull in, but I would recommend looking into Climate Action Network. I don't know if you're still here in, in the Woods Hole area. Um, yeah, so I would say here we have, uh, actually Brian's back up here, um, we have the Climate House um, in Woods Hole and also Woods Hole Research Center um, where we have scientists who are very involved in these processes and I mean even if you're not in the area anymore, maybe worth, worth reaching out to them and saying how do you, you know, get involved and, and um, participate as a scientist. At the national level, it says the climate education is very active on the U.S. carbon dividend. And carbon dividend, uh, next time it's going to come out in favor of the substitute session for carbon control. Carbon dividend, and it says that it's going to be out here for additional control. Jim, and then we have to turn it off. Okay, Jim Bishop from Berkeley sure. again. Three. Yes. Okay, <laughs> I really like the carbon capture sequestration car. And every year, Livermore publishes the wiring diagram for energy flows in the U.S. economy. And it's pretty clear most of petroleum use goes into transportation, and over two-thirds of that energy is wasted. Yeah. Uh, so it seems that that's low-hanging fruit in terms of driving electrification of transportation. I'm wondering how the conference's parties addressed uh, electric vehicles. Hmm. It wasn't a car show, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's interesting. I get the idea of, you know, capturing emissions in the tailpipe, but when people were looking at this, this is very thermodynamically expensive to do, uh, it, especially with the sequestration side of it. So the question is... Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, I would say, I don't know. Um, and it wasn't, transportation wasn't a prominent issue, and even in the technology kind of um, innovation gallery, transportation technologies were not prominent. So we're gonna stop it there. So if we can thank our speakers. <laughs>